here's my general advice for businesses. Don't be afraid to get help. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. This is Ben Eubanks. Before I get to the interview today um, with Eric Meyer, who's an attorney, we're going to talk through some of the new coronavirus laws, things like that, to give you some practical pointers and, and advice on how you can deal with what's going on. I want to take just a minute and read something that I recently wrote that kind of uh, embodies how I feel about this whole thing, what's going on. So before I get to that, really quick, a piece of practical advice or whatever you'd like to call it, on the Lighthouse Research and Advisory website. LHRA.io, I have started pulling together a list of HR technology companies that are offering free software or free tools or free advice or whatever they can offer to try to help out. That list is over 50 companies now. So if you were trying to figure out how to navigate all the things going on, there are a lot of companies that are trying to help other people like you, like me, in this space. And so, again, that's on the Lighthouse Research and Advisory website. The blog post is right there. You can check that one out. Now, I'm going to take a minute and read you a piece that I wrote the other day. On my other website, uh, Upstart HR, that community I've been running, curating, supporting for over 10 years now. Um, and I'm going to read this piece that I wrote just because I think it's relevant to what's going on here um, and help you just get a sense of my thoughts on the topic. Come on. You can do it. I know you can. I believe in you. I'm watching my baby make the transition to toddler, and it's a bittersweet moment. No longer will she stay where she's put. She's starting to explore the world, and that exploration will only speed up as time goes on. And that moment, the incredibly precious moment, is forever burned on memory. We learn early in life that when we fall, we try again. When we struggle, we try again. When we fail, we try again. We rise up again. In the grand scheme of things, simply standing up or doing something, doing anything, would be so much easier than hunkering down and cutting our ties to human contact and sitting around and waiting for this crisis to be over. Throughout this challenge we're going through as individuals and as communities, as families, as a global population, we have absolutely seen the worst that humanity has to offer. We've seen the hoarding, the selfishness, the anger, the hatred, those things have all appeared. We've also seen glimpses of the amazing grace and the love and the kindness that we all have to offer each other. In an eye-opening interview with a former astronaut and a flight leader for several key space missions, the interviewer asked, how do you survive in close quarters with these other people? They're not even your relatives, right? Maybe that's easier. How do you survive in close quarters of those people, those humans, for weeks and months on end? And his answer was pretty simple. He said, even if it's not easy in the moment, the recipe for success is doing one random act of kindness for someone else every single day. Just one random act of kindness. That practice formed deeper bonds created more goodwill, and smoothed over any potential slights or issues or friction that might appear in the day-to-day. -day. Is it perfect? No, but it did create an experience that allowed every person to try and bring out their best and most human qualities of charity and goodness that make us who we are. If rise up is too vague of an instruction, then resolve yourself to doing at least one random act of kindness daily for others. Better yet, why not journal that list of deeds so you can look back on it one day in the future and remember how you embraced your humanity in a time that tried to take it away from you. If you're a rational thinker, Thomas Paine once said, These are the times that try men's souls. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. If you're more spiritual, James said in the New Testament, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Either way, the concept of struggle isn't something new or novel, but an essential component of the human experience. Let's not just survive this thing. Let's rise up and share kindness, charity, compassion, and love for our friends, neighbors, communities, and families. I'll leave you with this. Come on. You can do it. I know you can. I believe in you. Thanks for joining me for the show today. And now, on with the episode. Hey, everybody. This has been Eubanks, host of We're Only Human. Glad to have you here today. I actually have a guest with me. We're going to talk through some of the things that are happening in the market right now. I'll try to give employers a little bit of information so that they can um, 
maybe lessen the chaos that's going on around them to the degree that we can. A lot of things out of our control right now. But today I have with me Eric Meyer. He is an attorney. He's a partner at Fisher Broyles. Welcome, Eric, to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Ben. How yes. you doing? Hey, I'm I'm doing as well as can be expected. I told someone that's kind of a more of a loaded question now, asking someone how they're doing than it was uh, even a few weeks ago. But um, everything's well here. How about you? Um, good. I used to joke, we, we both have four kids, that uh, my idea of babysitting is having them play out in the street. But that's really bad parenting in this day and age. So no, they're inside. We are observing social distancing and, and doing the best we can, just like everyone else. Awesome. So I mentioned that you're an attorney. Tell us a little more about uh, who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, I am an employment lawyer. Uh, I represent management at the oldest and largest distributed law firm. That's fancy speak for we are cloud based. Uh, most everyone is working from home this week. I do it all the time. So I, I love what I do. Um, I represent employers across the country. We're a full service firm. And I also have this blog called the Employer Handbook. Thanks for letting me get all these plugs in, Ben. Um, so if people don't get what they, what, you know, don't hear everything they need to hear about the COVID-19 epidemic and Families First Coronavirus Response Act, I write about it all the time. Check it out, theemployerhandbook.com, and you can sign up for free email updates. Awesome. Good deal. I was going to say, I, I read the blog regularly, and I also have actually been had the pleasure to see you speak a couple of times, and you, the same sort of informal conversational tone you'll hear today from Eric is what you can expect from him from the stage, right? He gives good advice. He's got solid, solid background, but he also makes it, you know, understandable for the rest of us, which I very much appreciate. So, whew, all right. And, said, I, and I wear a suit in the courtroom. Yes. I don't want yes. to let people think I'm too informal. <laughs> <laughs> Not too informal, just enough right. that you're relatable. How about that? Okay. It's the nicest thing I can say about you, Eric, other than that you, that you have four kids too. So, um, so everybody, you said epidemic a minute ago, right? We're all in a little bit of a state of shock. Lots of things going on, and I mentioned this earlier, half joking, half not. A lot of things out of our control. It's it's easy to feel like that right now. And I've been talking to a lot of my friends in the employment space this week, a lot of HR leaders that are trying to figure out what to do, how to survive this. And each industry has its own flavor of that, right? If you're HR in a in a healthcare industry right now, you're you're doing a different kind of problem than if you're in the travel and hospitality space, you have a different kind of problem. And so any advice just broadly, just kind of start out, I'm going to cast a wide net, any advice for employers um, right now as they're thinking through what decisions to make, how to communicate that, you know, six months from now, a year from now, they're going to look back and say that was a good decision versus a kind of a rash decision. Oh. Any advice there? Here's my general advice for businesses. And that is don't be afraid to get help. And I don't mean this to, to stump for myself. I mean, get help from wherever you can, uh, whether it's an employment lawyer, it's, you know, from human resources, a friend in a, in a different company. Find out what other people are doing, because there are a lot of mistakes that can be made right now, whether from um, you know, something as simple as a, a Fair Labor Standards Act mistake. You know, if you have people, non-exempt employees who are teleworking, right? Are you appropriately tracking their hours? What systems do you have in place in that for all the way up to something critically serious, like someone shows up in your workplace and they tell you that they have COVID-19. So um, like you said, Ben, this is new to pretty much all of us, um, or at least these types of issues. And um, you know, it is really important to go out and seek help when you need it, because it's very easy to get in over your head. I think that's good advice for sure. It's just slow down. I mean, it feels like everything's rushed, but slow down a little bit. Don't just jump out there and, and make the first thing that, that someone says as a decision. Um, I actually have, I was telling you a little bit ago before we started this, that I have been working with uh, our, our local our local uh, church daycare trying to figure out how to how to handle worker pay and all those other things right and trying to trying to sort through those things so again it's all over the place in terms of things that employers are working on um, you mentioned the FFCRA make sure I got that acronym mm -hmm. right um, what are some of the provisions in there and I know and like we'll preface that with these things are evolving and they're still like clarifying things there but what are some of the big provisions there that employers need to be aware of as they're thinking through what to do next 
Sure. There are three buckets um, that employers need to be aware of. The first bucket is what I'll call paid sick leave. And the paid sick leave comes into play for six different types of situations. Um, basically, um, a, a state, local, or federal isolation or quarantine order when you yourself as the employee have coronavirus symptoms, when you are um, going to a doctor to get checked out, when you are caring for a loved one with coronavirus symptoms, when um, you are caring for a child that's home from school because school is closed uh, due to coronavirus. And there's this other catch-all that basically gives some flexibility to the government to create other avenues to collect paid sick, paid sick leave. We're not quite sure what those are yet, but those are the six. Um, so that's paid sick leave. Paid sick leave is basically up to two weeks of pay, 80 hours full-time and a prorated portion if you're part-time. And depending on the reason or reasons why you take paid sick leave, um, that the, the amount of pay you can get is contingent upon the reason. So at best, you can get up to $511 per day if you are a full-time employee. And um, for other reasons, it's up to $200 per day. So that's, that's basically paid sick leave in a nutshell. Uh, the other bucket number two is what I'll call expanded FMLA or emergency FMLA. It it is not just for the employers that have 50 or more employees. This is for all employers up to 499 employees. And the same goes for the paid sick leave. Anyone with 500 or more is not covered by this new law. So the Expanded Family and Medical Leave Act covers that one of the types of leave that you can get paid sick leave on. And that is if you are home and you can't work or telework and you are caring for um, children who are home from school um, because the school is closed down because of coronavirus concerns. If you um, check all of those boxes, then your first two weeks of leave are unpaid. Your last 10 weeks of leave are paid at two thirds of your salary up to a maximum of $200 a day. So the way it would work in, in, in practical, all practical purposes is you'd get paid sick leave for two weeks, and then you'd get the expanded FMLA leave for 10 weeks with some pay there. And then after 12 weeks, you're done. Um, the final bucket and, and a really important bucket for, for employers is tax credits. This All forms of paid leave under this Families First Coronavirus Response Act, Ben, are government are paid for by the government. And the way it works is the employer fronts the money so to speak, like you would just like you would pay out any other form of paid time off, mm -hmm. you pay it as the employer. And then quarterly, you get trued up through a 100 percent tax credit against Social Security taxes. Now, there are exceptions for certain employers. The IRS is talking about um, maybe expediting or, or kind of fronting the money to some employers that don't have the liquidity to be able to do this. Um, so I, I don't want to get into too too much detail because I'll, I'll crush your readers. And frankly, I don't know all the detail because the IRS hasn't, hasn't issued it yet. But those are the three main things that employers should be concerned about. Paid sick leave, expanded or emergency FMLA, I'm using those terms synonymously, and the tax credits that you get at the back end. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that's – I've been reading like crazy about it every, every time I get a chance because uh, – I thought that I was outside the bubble for people that are that have to make decisions about this, and then, like I, was, like I mentioned a minute ago, I was we're we're trying to as a board decide what we're going to do with our own workers here and trying to decide how how much we can afford to pay them and everything else, and then we found out well well the tax credits come now help with that even though we already decided to pay them, so we can continue to because we're going to get some of that money back in payroll taxes. So we're trying to figure out how to how far we can stretch that, and that's that's a great thing for those employers. I was, I was trying to guess at why it was under 500 employees. I don't know if you have like any any guesses. I do know why it's that small. Yeah, a little birdie told me a few things about that. Um, one is is that there was an assumption. I think it's a bit of a false assumption that employers with 500 or more employees probably have more robust paid time off policies in place that will protect workers in a situation like this. I think some do, but a lot don't. So I, I think that's a bit of a misnomer. 
And the other one is because this is govern ultimately government funded, the government can't afford to do this for employers with 500 or more employees. So there had to be a cutoff point. Otherwise, you know, we just ran out of money. So yes. that's where the, the, the cutoff came. That's interesting. I don't have the – I wish I had my chart right here in front of me that I, I – keep for some of the research we do because we did some studies last year of employers that have less than a thousand employees and it was like 99 point something percent of the companies in the u.s are companies of that size and so there's still a the company's over 500 it's still a you know less than a certain percentage the pretty small number overall of the employers in the u.s like you said they they either have the money they assume or they have the stability or the benefits or something else to back that up whereas a company with with 25 employees, there's not a chance they're going to be able to, to pull something off like that. Um, so, okay, interesting. I was curious. I, I'm glad I thought that I would get a shrug there from you, but I got an actual answer, so I appreciate that. One thing I want to ask you is, I I can't speak for everybody, but I'd love to hear one or two of the questions that you've gotten over the last week from employers. Like this, the, these are the most common, you know, one or two questions I've gotten, and a little bit of advice you'd give them. It just like you would someone else, if you don't mind sharing that. Sure. Um, well, I, I'll take it away from the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Yeah, sure. I, 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 we'll just talk generically. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions about layoffs. It's sad. Um, and, you know, how do we do it? Um, is WARN, the WARN, Federal WARN Act implicated? Are, um, and and, and the, the WARN Act, for, for some of your listeners who may not be familiar with it, it's basically this law, this federal law that requires an employer to provide notice when it, it engages in a plant closure or a mass layoff. And if you have 100 or more employees, um, you're covered under WARN. And um, depending on the size of the layoff, that may trigger this notice requirement. And if you don't give the proper notice under ordinary circumstances, you could be responsible for all the back pay that employees would have earned during that notice period. There's a 60 day notice period. And what we're encountering now is, you know, is this one of those situations where there's no need for the notice or, or rather the 60 day notice period can be waived because of unforeseen circumstances or a natural disaster. Um, so that's one issue that I'm wrestling with layoffs and WARN act also with the Americans with disabilities act. Um, Early on in this pandemic, we were getting questions like, can we take employees' temperatures? Well, the answer now is yes, if you want to. Um, should, you know, still a hot one is, should we be asking for doctor's notes? Um, and, you know, it, I don't have a great answer to that. I mean, I think in, in an ideal world, okay, but this isn't an ideal world right now. We have hospitals that are busting at the seams because they're dealing with really sick people. So if we're going to ask, everyone that has a fever or the sniffles or something like that to come back with a doctor's note before they can come back to work. Mm. Um, uh, you know, th that may be too much of a, uh, compounding uh, problem the, just to it, it satisfy could, some policy for a doctor's note. Yeah, it, it really could be. So, so that's, that's another issue. And then, you know, what, what happens when someone presents with, with, Coronavirus, or they've been in close contact with someone. All of a sudden, lawyers are becoming doctors, and we're we're doing the best we can to to advise our clients. Uh, you know, for what it's worth, fortunately, that's not as much of an issue anymore since most states are issuing stay-at-home orders, and we're not having employees come into the workplace um, and potentially uh, it, it, it infecting or, or spreading the the coronavirus disease. So those are some of the issues I'm encountering, and I am. Um, I don't want to look at this optimist opportunistically and certainly not optimistically, but I am I am just waiting for once all of this ends and once we get back to somewhat normal in the way we conduct our business, that's when I think all the lawsuits are going to hit. You know, all of the companies that failed, you know, all of the Warren lawsuits, all of the Fair Labor Standards Act lawsuits because of the companies that didn't provide the paid sick leave properly. All of the whistleblower lawsuits for employees who claim they were fired because they raised a concern about safety conditions in the workplace. All of the Family Medical Leave Act lawsuits. I mean, you name it. I think six months after all of this ends, the courts are just going to be choked with employment lawsuits. It's going to be nuts. I mean, right now it's quiet because 
people just aren't filing lawsuits yeah, right everybody's now. It's not down. that important. <laughs> yep, everyone's hunkered down. Six months from now, or whenever this ends, it's going to be crazy. That will be a wild time. I told someone the other day that there's a there was a an HR leader who was saying, you know, we're we're trying to figure this out, and we're like taking it day by day, even hour by hour, to figure out how to respond. And she said, I don't want someone to come back and say, like you were saying, like we did the wrong thing. And she's like, so we're being overly generous. We're trying to go above and beyond, trying to be overly communicative. And I think that that will show the kind of employers, right? The ones that typically the employers, not always, I don't want to make generalizations, but the employers that sometimes get those issues are the ones that are kind of skirting the issues anyway in the first place. And this is just going to amplify that and show how out of touch they were with their workforce and how they their management practices probably weren't in the best interest of their team. So uh, there's no telling, like you said, what's going to happen there. It'll be very interesting to watch, and it'll be a busy uh, last half of the year for you, just like the first half has been, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. Yep. I am, uh, I'm not getting much sleep, but that's okay. That's, that's okay. All right. Um, well, Eric, this has been great. If someone wants to learn more, they want to connect with you. I know you shared the link to the blog a little bit ago. Will you share that again in any other ways that they can, they can connect with you to learn more about what you're doing or how, um, they could potentially use your help? Sure. Uh, blog, the employer handbook.com. Um, my, our law firm is Fisher Broyles. That's F I S H E R B R O Y L E S dot com. You can find my bio and stuff there. Connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter. Twitter is Eric underscore B as in boy underscore Meyer, M E Y E R. Um, You'll connect with me one way or another. It'll be all good. Just look him up. You'll find him. He's all over yep. the place, and he's doing good work for employers everywhere. We appreciate what you're doing, Eric. Um, thank you very much for taking some time out of your very busy schedule to join us for the show today. Thanks for having me, Ben. You you stay healthy and uh, stay strong, man. Absolutely. To everybody else, thank you for joining us for the show. This has been Eubanks, your host, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you for listening to We're Only Human. Please take a moment to share this episode with another HR leader who might see it as a valuable resource in their daily work. For more information about the podcast and to see all our show archives, please visit upstarthr.com.